uh, uh, asthma management what kind of medicine works when to use uh, those drugs and when to escalate uh, respiratory support and i'll be dwelling little bit into pathophysiology and uh, for concepts of post pressure ventilation because uh, keeping in mind our uh, post graduates were listening because i know it is difficult to understand them by reading it uh, once from book so i'll just start with some uh, case uh, masqueraders or mimics of uh, wheezers in uh, children which has already been uh, uh, spoken in the first session also by uh, sir balan sir the first case is a 2 year old male cough for one day no fever fast breathing since last 4 hours has no significant past history there is tachycardia tachypnea uh, disproportional uh, tachypnea and agitation but still the child is um, having a normal sensorium normal saturation and there is uh, auscultation there is wheeze on the right side with decreased air entry on the left side and this is the x ray you can see classically there is a unilateral hyperinflation uh, in the uh, referring hospital and when it comes to our hospital it becomes more obvious with a mediastinal shift so here uh, we are expecting a foreign body which was removed uh, again uh, again another case a 6 year old male with a fever and cough for 5 days had fast like fast breathing and decreased activity for one day there is tachycardia tachypnea there is minimal work of breathing and there is bilateral scattered wheeze here again with a normal saturation nebulizations were or ordered as the er was busy and just x ray was ordered but it took 2 hours and the child didn't respond to nebulizations that that's when a uh, bpg was done which showed metabolic acidosis and this is the x ray where we can clearly see a cardiomegaly and uh, what was missed here was uh, you know since the er was busy the resident didn't check for the pulses because a 6 year old you know uh, kind of looking okay but little dull but the pulses were weak there were muffled heart sounds and in history there was decreased urine output and there was a large liver span which was missed so actually kind of two hours was missed in managing this myocarditis probably a viral myocarditis child uh, which was later shifted to a pico and ventilated so this is a another four month old infant presenting with fever and cough since three days had fast breathing decreased feeding since three days extreme tachycardia tachypnea significant work of breathing with uh, hypoxia chest also had bilateral wheeze so this is the chest x ray picture obviously we have a uh, you know bilateral you can say you know uh, mediastinal widening and lymphadenopathy probably here with uh, dirty infiltrates everywhere so this turned out to be a, a lymphadenopathy extrinsic lymphadenopathy compressing the airways you can see both the trachea as well as the uh, both the left and main, uh, right main bronchus compressed by the external lymph node this turned out to be a tb again we have to be careful this is a 4 month old infant where uh, we think it is bronchiolitis but you know uh, sometimes it can be a totally different entity here it was a tb it was a kind of like from the mother who was a open contact coming to another case a 3 year old male having fever cough again for 3 days difficulty in breathing for 6 hours here heart rate was 170 again uh, tachypneic with decreased air entry with hypoxia the child was unable to lie on bed with mother paradoxical breathing pattern was seen the child was extremely having you know agitation with moving all the four limbs bad air hunger child identifies mother but cannot unable to speak and there was no similar illness or significant past history so here you can see bilateral hyperinflation just by looking at the history we think it could be probably a pneumonia because you know there is hypoxia there is fever and cough there is uh, acute onset of breathlessness and decreased air entry but actually here this is actually a viral uh, like virus viral infection induced wheeze with decreased air entry so sometimes we tend to miss this uh, decreased air entry this is actually kind of the 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 management goes hand in hand with asthma management actually but we think it is pneumonia and we a uh, kind of you know delay nebulization sometimes so this again is important where we see decreased air entry we uh, kind of miss the wheeze component because it's a, it's a kind of a silent chest you know where giving nebulization may also be difficult so in all these cases the first treatment received by the uh, all the four cases was nebulization with uh, acetylene with oxygen which may be right which may not be right so all wheezes need not be bronchiolitis or asthma we need to rule out the asthma mimics any sick child remember any sick child hyperventilating may have a wheeze any child tachypneic may have wheeze like even we have seen dka children with tachypnea having wheeze and being treated with nebulizations 
obviously. Entities which can present with Vs at ER, first Vs at ER can be like asthma, viral triggered Vs, pneumonia, foreign body aspiration, congestive cardiac failure or myocarditis, uh, and others being upper airway and lower airway obstruction caused by other causes like fixed obstruction in case of vocal cord dysfunction, airway hemangiomas, and enlarged lymph nodes, and dynamic obstruction in cases of uh, laryngotracheal bronchomalacia or vascular sling anomalies. So coming back to the case, uh, which we are going to discuss in detail, an eight-year-old female, a known case of asthma with prior history of poor compliance to therapy, uh, recurrent ho hospitalizations with PICU admissions uh, in the past, came to ER with another exacerbation with tachycardia, tachypnea, and increased work of breathing. There is bilateral decreased air entry and saturation is only 90% and in room air and she's able to speak only few words and the, but the sensorium is normal and blood gas done was normal. Ex peak expiratory flow was 50% of the personal best. And she's not responding to initial back-to-back -back nebulizations and IV steroids, what next? So we all know the components in asthma being, uh, you know, airway hyper-responsiveness, bronchospasm and chronic inflammation leading on to airway remodeling. So, Stadial asthmaticus is a common emergency in children which, uh, where there is progress of worsening bronchospasm and the respiratory dysfunction unresponsive to the first line therapy and which may progress to respiratory failure. Why is it very important? Because timely treatment can prevent a lot of complications which we don't want. And this is the uh, simple picture telling you what kind of changes is seen in the airway. There is enlargement of submucosa and there is ex in excess of infil inflammatory infiltrates and mucosal, uh, you know, excess of mucus causing mucus plugging. And remember, asthma is an heterogeneous disease. This is a very important concept to understand. Uh, there can be environmental trigger in a genetically predisposed individual, but it is a heterogeneous disease. All the airways are not equally affected. And uh, there can be mucus plugging, there can be bronchospasm, there can be inflammation. Different causes of airway obstruction, which may respond to different therapy. Uh, and early bronchospasm responds to, uh, you know, short-acting beta agonist and late bronchospasm will respond only to anti-inflammatory drugs like steroids. Coming to this uh, concept of dynamic hyperinflation, I won't again bore you with this, uh, you know, picture which, you know, uh, which is difficult to understand. What I'm trying to say is with every, like, you know, with time, there is more air trapping. That is air enters, it is like a ball wall mechanism. Air enters into the lungs through a narrowed airway air enters into the alveoli, but it is being trapped and doesn't come out during expiration. Because expiration, normally there is, you know, uh, the intrapleural pressure swing in that way so that it becomes a little positive. So initially in wheezing, the expiratory uh, portion of uh, respiration becomes compromised. And that is where you have airway narrowing. And that's where you have airway trapping, air trapping. So there is, uh, you can see the lung volume keeps on increasing. And above a certain level, the FRC itself shifts above. So the, uh, the, you know, the kind of lung kind of collapses after that, kind of chokes after that. The lungs are compliant, but the volumes in the lung is very high. Uh, the base, the basic volume. So the FRC is increased, thereby pushing the lungs to this, it's closing pressures. So too much of concept, very difficult to understand, right? That's why I've gone, to, gone for a simple analogy. Like balloon, imagine a balloon, which is being obstructed partially. Don't think because if it is partially obstructed, the balloon will deflate. But think of it, think of it as an obstructed airway. When it is partially obstructed, you keep seeing the airway getting filled, alveol is getting filled, but not able to empty. About a certain limit, it's going to just blow out, right? This is what is called as dynamic hyperinflation. So either it blows out or you release the obstruction over here and release the uh, balloon. That's what we want to do by our therapy. And another important thing is this longer time constant. You can imagine this peak hour traffic in Chennai city where you have different vehicles with different, uh, you know, uh, time constants. That's why I put cars, you know, two wheelers, auto rickshaws, buses and everything so that you have all of them going through the same, you know, uh, narrowed airway or exit and everyone are rushing. So it becomes difficult, right? This is the problem. There is shorter expiratory time for the airways to empty. That's why we need to prolong these, uh, you know, expiratory times so that uh, they can pass out easily. This is what is the basic concept, concept of time constant, 
where they always say time constant, no one understands. They always say compliance and resistance, but actually this is what is it. In asthma, time constants are longer because of obstruction and we need to uh, dilate the airway and relieve the obstruction so that air goes in and comes out smoothly. And in ER, now coming back to business, in ER, we do rapid assessment, like uh, the you know pediatric assessment triangle and the pentagon. Uh, basically to do a quick respiratory and hemodynamic um, analysis of the child to categorize the patient physiologically and to, uh, to decide what kind of treatment the patient requires and where to shift and all. History at, at ER, what relevant history, quick history you have to take is time of onset, potential triggers which could have been there and severity of symptoms in the previous exacerbation if there was a known, if it is a known asthmatic like our case and response to treatment at home or emergency uh, prior to coming to hospital. And in physical examination, we need to look at the pulse oximetry, air entry, the characteristic of the bees, is it inspiratory or both inspiratory or expiratory, the level of alertness of the child. Usually they are hyper alert. They are a little agitated, they are hyper alert. If they are dull and drowsy, it's ominous. The hydration status, the work of breathing, and to also identify complications because sometimes the child can just land up with the air leak to the ER with a pneumothorax or a pneumomediastinum. So what are the risk factors or red flags at ER? When there is a past history of ICU admission for asthma, when there is a rapid deterioration in the condition in the past with mechanical ventilation, preterm MICU graduates who had prolonged NICU stay with ox prolonged oxygen exposure, chronic lung disease, psychosocial, ethnic factors, and poor, you know, parental education or poor complaints to treatment. There are genetic factors. Obese children are at higher risk. Older age presentation have higher risk. And pulses paradoxes also poses a higher risk. So at ER, we categorize them into uh, critical, emergent, urgent, less urgent, as far as treatment is concerned, based on the severity of symptoms. So wheezing, uh, I just go through it fast. There can be severe tachypnea or bradypnea, severe uh, retractions with grunting and drowsy, drowsy or lethargic sensorium means it is critical. And auscultation, you have decreased breath sounds, hypoxia, and PEF, low PEF, and the child is unable to speak or able to speak only few words. And as it becomes, you know, uh, like if the child is having fewer retractions, fewer, like lesser work of breathing, normal saturation, uh, but history of, you know, severe uh, like episodes in the past, that also needs urgent uh, management. And as the child is able to uh, speak sentences, uh, when the work of breathing is less, it becomes little, you know, a mild to moderate kind of exacerbation. And remember, always a severe exacerbating exacerbation child will be preferring to sit in an upright position, and there will be difficulty or refusal to feed, feed in a smaller child. child. And uh, also remember SpO2, uh, PaCO2 or ETCO2 doesn't grade the severity. Again, we need to use some severity score to severe uh, to grade them. So basically, they use the work of breathing, basically the suprastinal and uh, the suprastinal and the scalene muscle, the neck muscle usage is considered severe. Air entry, decreased air entry, and uh, is again bad. Bees, which is both inspiratory and expiratory, is bad. Low saturation is again bad. Again, some scores don't, this is the PRAM, which is validated in children, uh, which I put it here. But there are other scores which include consciousness level and inspiratory to expiratory ratio. Like when the expiration is prolonged visibly, you can see that that also poses a higher risk and goes, calls for a severe scoring. At ER, what do you do? So you have a like severely ill child, like our case, when there is a silent chest, it's an ominous sign when there is altered mental status it is an ominous sign look for asymmetry because don't miss out on uh, the you know foreign body scenario or there can be asymmetric bees even when there is a local atelectasis or when there is air leak it's important to identify two clinical subsets one which is having a history of severe past episodes which is poorly controlled asthma where it's called a slow onset and where anti-inflammatory steroids work another subset is a child with mild symptoms in the past or coming with first time bees. This is fast onset. This is these, these children respond better to beta agonists first. The importance is these fast onset kids, they don't give you long time. They just deteriorate very fast. So you need to start treatment on them very early at an early time. Okay. So based on the severity, you're going to start the treatment. 
mild just requires uh, mdi puff or nebulization alone and we prefer puffs because of uh, less aeros aerosols because of the covid thing going on in moderate scenarios better to start nebulizations intermittent or continuous with oxygen and oral or iv corticosteroids need to be given in severe cases continuous nebulizations of with salbutamol is preferred with oxygen and intermittent uh, nebulization with ipratropium three at least three times in the first hour and the advantage of ipratropium is it uh, is a different mechanism and it it is uh, supposed to reduce the the study say it reduces the length of stay and it reduces uh, the um, you know it it another advantage is it preserves preserves the mucociliary uh, clearance so it is good in that way and in severe cases we prefer iv corticosteroids and also in the first hour we prefer to give a start dose of iv magnesium sulfate and also uh, inform the uh, availability of a psu bit so why do we nebulize with oxygen this is a common question so when you don't nebulize with when normally what happens when there is hypoxic uh, hypoxia in the obstructed airway the blood kind of diverts to the well ventilated zones this is the normal compensation to maintain the vq uh, like mismatch which happens with asthma when you nebulize with salbutamol alone what happens is these uh, instead of opening the airways first the salbutamol dilates the blood vessels in those constricted zones so there is stealing of blood from better uh, ventilated zones with better vq uh, you know like better vq ventilation perfusion matching so this kind of you know uh, cause, like causes a transient hypoxia because of the stealing of this blood from well ventilated zones to these uh, poorly ventilated zones but with time it kind of the cardiac output improves and the bronch like vasodilation like bronchodilation also ensues but that's why it's important to uh, start oxygen with salbutamol in severe cases to prevent this hypoxia so this uh, said well that said uh, in puffs uh, mdi puffs how to use based on the weight it's 4 6 8 for the first 10 kg it is 4 puffs for 10 to 20 kg it is 6 puffs and about 20 kg it is 8 puffs and also for severe cases you need to start steroids and along with ipratropium nebulizations and sometimes subcutaneous adrenaline or tributylin rescue may be important at 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 times when there is a challenge with uh, life threatening hypoxia and remember in severe cases we give continuous nebulizations Uh, up to 0.5 mg per kg per hour to a maximum of 20 mg per hour of salbutamol what is important is repeated assessment to uh, and score trends uh, we start the treatment and we cannot move uh, away because in a severe case repeated assessment of respiratory uh, score the consciousness level basically the heart rate respiratory spo2 will tell many things heart rate settling respiratory rate coming down saturation improving and child being more comfortable able to speak better becoming less breathless is a positive sign and at the end of 4 hours we need to decide what has to be done so this slide is just for telling you the doses in various scenarios like uh, based on the weight and what we have to uh, importantly know is with uh, like nebulizations we tend to give lesser uh, dose of salbutamol or ipratropium thereby reducing the uh, overall side effects one thing uh, what is uh, problematic in severe asthmatic is the delivery of the nebulization because many time we think we are nebulizing but it is not reaching the uh, place where it has to work but still that said nebulizations uh, with nebulization we can achieve the response with a lesser dose than with a puff or with a uh, oral substitute so whenever there is non responsiveness think of poor neb delivery we need to use a proper mdi with spacer if you are using uh, like with with spacer but the problem is again cooperation of the child is needed in a severe episode it may be difficult again proper uh, dose with proper carrier solution 3 to 5 ml of saline is preferred with minimal interruptions proper technique the vertical position of the neck chamber is missed sometimes with uh, which is seen as good fume generation which is important uh, for you know effective nebulization the uh, and all phase nebulize with oxygen 6 to 8 liters as told before and also the nebulization should finish within 10 to 15 minutes which is a sign of good uh, nebulization uh, technique steroids any anything can be used but know the uh, maximum dosage uh, which can be used and the frequency like hydrocortisone is a short acting prednisolone and methylprednisolone is intermediate 
and dexamethasone is long acting and the maximum dose usage has been uh, put here in this slide. The other drugs, magnesium sulfate, uh, another important drug which we use, intermittent high dosing is preferred rather than a continuous infusion. This is what is latest evidence tells. Intermittent high dose, like that is 0.1 ml per kg, which is 50 mg per kg or 50% max self to a maximum of two gram or uh, like can be used, which is one, one ml is 500 mg. So you can maximum use four ml of max self, even if the, if the child is 60 kg. Turbutylin, again, a rescue drug can be given subcutaneously or IV. IV is preferred 10 mics per kg, uh, is the loading dose. We don't usually load the children. We start with an infusion of 0.4 mics to, uh, per kg per minute and we go up to 3 mics per kg per minute. It's uh, it's not available everywhere. And in ventilated children or rescue type drugs are ketamine and aminophilin. And again, ketamine can be uh, given like to a dose up to 1 mg per kg per hour. And aminophilin is loaded with 5 mg per kg and followed by an infusion. Remember, aminophilin should not be given beyond 24 hours and infants require a lesser dose because of the, uh, you know, the therapeutic level may exceed in them because of the pharmacokinetics. So as I told you, when there is good treatment response with a mild exacerbation, you just have to observe them for four to six hours. If there is no further worsening, you can just discharge them on, on uh, oral bronchodilators or MDIs and steroids for short, short course, probably three to five days. But if there is poor response, when there is significant work of breathing, despite nebulization, proper nebulization, when there is worsening uh, clinical status, when the PFR is not improving, when there is hypoxia, we need to escalate care to a setting like HDO or PICU. So next five minutes or so, I'll be spending on you know this ventilation thing, where we use a lot of NIV nowadays, which is preferred and NIV trial is always warranted before invasive mechanical ventilation because we don't want to ventilate any asthmas. And at least in the last uh, two or three years, I have not seen even a single ventilated uh, asthma child. The, because of the benefits of NIV. There is decreased need for intubation. There is improved gas exchange and alveolar ventilation. There is, it relieves the dyspnea of the child and decreases work of breathing and decreases length. Thereby, it decreases length of stay because we are avoiding invasive ventilation. And the commonest NIV which we use is HHFNC, heated humidified high flow nasal cannula. It has a comfortable interface. Many of you might be using it. It works by reducing the anatomical dead space by flushing the nasopharyngeal cavity with fresh gas flow, meeting the inspiratory demand of the child. And it also kind of stems the upper airway and reduces the work of breathing. And also importantly, the nebulization can be delivered better with HFNC. And the dose is like we say, you know, two liters per kg for the first 10 kg, followed by 0.5 liter per kg to a maximum of 40 liters in children. And sometimes 50 liters in obese children can also be used. And FiO2 is usually titrated to achieve a saturation above 94, we usually start with 50 to 60% FiO2. And we use these vibrating mesh nebulizers these days because it kind of maintains the laminar flow uh, and it maintains the FiO2 and temperature with better entrainment of the nebulized cases with good delivery to the place where it has to work. These are the uh, you know new uh, techniques. And these uh, are connected to the wet side of the humidifier that is post humidification we connect them before it, it it reaches the circuit that's where we connect the nebulization chamber so again yeah so again uh, we are having some settings i'm not going to discuss in detail just uh, the mode on nav sometimes we use escalate hfnc to nav where we can use bipap or standalone nav ventilators we prefer to use st mode in bipap or psv mode in uh, nav we, may, we need to make sure we are using a proper interface, proper mask that is important without leak. And I'm not going to go into settings. If I was again to be maintaining the saturation above 92, make sure the peak pressure don't go above 20 centimeter of water. We usually start with say 10 by five or 12 by five. Again, we need to be cautious when you are putting a patient on an AV because the margin of safety is less. And if the patient is worsening, we need to go for invasive ventilation. We avoid invasive ventilation as much as possible. But I tell you, NIV is an alternate, but not a substitute for ventilation. And that said, endotracheal tube, putting a tube into the airway is not going to solve the problem, right? Because the airway is narrowed down distally, but we're going to put the tube only up to the uh, trachea, maybe upper trachea or mid trachea. So 
the endotracheal tube itself can ex 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 exacerbate your asthma that is the problem that's why we don't ventilate right and but sometimes you know we need to ventilate like we need we end up ventilating them and uh, and again this is not ventilation is purely mostly clinical rather than uh, you know lab values the indication being imminent cardiorespiratory failure refractory hypoxemia deteriorating sens sensorium or the child going in for respiratory fatigue or coming with respiratory fatigue significant respiratory acidosis not responding to other drugs and niv so how to go about that that's a very uh, dangerous like situation which we do which is a nightmare kind of thing when you are intubating an asthmatic because we have to prepare extensively there can be a, it's a high risk intubation we need an expert to intubate and it's usually done when we have exhausted all the other things the acute one like we need to use a larger et tube probably a cuff et tube and uh, reduce the dead space as much as possible in the circuitry drugs we prefer prefer to use midazolam ketamine uh, propofol for induction and we always use paralytic we always use paralytic probably a short acting one procuronium or vecuronium and when we intubate we need to have extensive tools to monitor like etco2 and we need to have a good venous access and bp monitoring why because a patient can immediately land up in issues like uh, you know like respiratory worsening respiratory acidosis pneumothorax or hemodynamic instability the principles again i'm going to just summarize in a slide the mode commonly we use is simv volume control or pressure control with pressure support which is the most commonly used mode there is no preferred mode other modes which can be used are prvc psv settings we i'll just highlight we need to use a lower respiratory rate for age the lowest like possible rate to allow you know the longer e time that's the uh, rational behind that tidal volume of 6 to 8 ml per kg and maintain the p plateau pressures below 30 and prolonging the ie ratio setting peep that is a you know that is itself is an art i'll tell you in the next slide how to set a peep in a, a, a asthmatic volume control has like uh, advantage of constant flow so that we can keep the i time short but any anything we can any mode we can use neuromuscular blockade remember we should use only in the early phase to uh, you know avoid the air hunger compromising on the ventilation later on we should not use them in volume modes we need to monitor the pressures that is the peak pressure and the uh, like difference between the peak pressure and the plateau pressure that is important when you do an expiratory hold we can find the difference and uh, try to limit that and as it is getting better as the asthma is getting the episode is getting better the, the difference kind of reduces and in pressure mode we monitor the tidal volume usually the tidal volume keeps improving as the uh, asthmatic episode is improving as far as sedation is concerned we use midazolam or dexmedetomidin infusion analgesia we use fentanyl or ketamine infusion we avoid morphine because it it can worsen histamine release and bronchospasm monitor we have to monitor complications obviously it is a high risk scenario as i told you we can it, there can be worsening respiratory acidosis air leak and the patient can go for a secondary ARDS for a mixed lung disease and there can be hemodynamic instability also because of the peep which we give so a slide on this uh, i know it is beyond the scope of this lecture but still what happens is uh, uh, coming back to the first slide which i discussed about the balloon analogy we give more air into the balloon what's going to happen it's going to blow out similarly when we, when i'm going to give a pressure it's going to blow out right but the reverse thing happens in a severe case we don't obviously give p for all asthmatics this is reserved for severe spec, uh, like subset of patients in them when you use the peep when you use the positive pressure it instead of inflating more instead of worsening the hyperinflation it kind of when you obviously use optimal correct peep it is going to offset your work of breathing it's going to paradoxically deflate the lungs uh, and improve the you know uh, situation how it does how sorry how does it going to help for example we have a auto peep that this is this is called, the concept is like you have heard of auto peep there is a high intrinsic positive pressure in the alveoli like here like we have a intrinsic pressure of 15 and the outside pleural pressure is say 10 till the pressure difference is maintained the airway is open like you know the patient has to maintain some of this positive pressure and uh, the the outside pressure has to be like trans pulmonary pressure we call 15 minus 10 so as far as it is positive the airway will be open at a point where uh, in during expiration you can see this 
pressure kind of reduces and becomes thin equalizes the outside pressure this point is called as a choking point and the lung airway kind of collapses there and there is no more air flow further so by giving an external peep we are going to you know equalize this or you know kind of increases increase the trans pressure so we are going to make it positive above the pleural pressure so that the airway opens and air flow happens so you can see here also when there is no peep the pressure difference is high and the patient cannot overcome it but when you give a counter peep when you give a counter peep the airway opens further uh, the airway analogy like the, when the patients how why the patients can't expire this is explained by the waterfall analogy like where there is the similarly there is upstream and a downstream segment like imagine a waterfall which is not able to fall down there is lot of water over here which is not able to reach uh, which is not able to come down the same thing is happening because of this choking point or uh, called as a critical opening pressure what we do by up appealing applying an external peep we kind of you know equalize this or kind of you know reduce the pressure gradient you know thereby when you reduce the pressure gradient the resistance comes down and the flow kind of improves so we can see when we apply an external peep which is equal into the auto peep there is flow of water as well as gas and when but any any peep higher than that is useless like when the extrinsic auto peep is only 10 we have to give anywhere around 10 like we said kind of keep two thirds of the auto peep that is the uh, you know usual teaching like we try to keep seven here but here if you go beyond that the peep is useless and it's going to cause harm affecting your hemodynamics so this is the concept behind that again here it helps not only in expiration but also in inspiration here we can see with no a problem in the airway the negative pressure is only required is only one to start inspiration but here with intrinsic peep only like say there is auto peep of 10 you need to give a effort of minus 11 negative pressure of minus 11 to suck the air in otherwise the air flow may not happen in inspiration also when you give an external peep to this patient say 8 the patient only has to provide like uh, overcome it by a negative pressure of only say 3 so you can see the pressure gradient being reduced in the presence of an obstruction when we provide an extrinsic peep so it not only in allows act like uh, expiration but also offsets the inspiratory work load so this is an important concept i think you would have understood with this uh, analogy and this uh, you know the difference the pressure difference i or i all i would just want you to understand that the pressure difference should always be positive for the airway to remain open the trans pressure and by giving an external pressure we are going to reduce the inspiratory negative workload the patient has to take a very deep inspiration right uh, that itself will compromise your expiration by reducing your time constant expiratory time constant so these are complex concepts again always remember it's not only the airway it is enclosed by the pleura with a positive pressure so here again when they are providing the external peep the inspiratory workload has come down here without peep the patient has to generate a minus 9 here the patient can only generate the uh, can initiate inspiration with only minus 3 pressure so this is the advantage of providing peep that said all the drugs have side effects and we need to monitor them with beta agonist the commonest side effect is tachycardia hypokalemia may happen hyperglycemia may happen and they may have tremors and lactic acidosis is another problem especially and it can be even seen with inhalational route people think it's only happens with iv route with iv beta agonist like terbutalin we need to be careful about arrhythmia hypotension especially diastolic and myocardial ischemia so that itself may warrant inotropic support steroids again hyper like dexamethasone causes hyperglycemia hypertension and secondary infection risk with magnesium we need to monitor reflexes it itself can cause muscle weakness and hypotension so that's why we target a magnesium level between 3 to 4 and we don't cross 4 aminophilin can cause again we rarely use nowadays it can cause neurotoxicity like seizures polyuria and we need to monitor levels whenever available again some treatments like ketamine very rarely used can increase secretions and can cause airway obstruction aminophilin is only used as rescue in impending respiratory failure therapies like inhaled corticosteroids nebulized maxelf nebulized uh, formitrol or salmetrol nebulized 
tyrosinium or oral uh, montelukast or zafirlukast oral liquid in antagonist immunotherapy biologicals don't work in status asthmaticus don't work in acute phase but they may be useful for preventing exacerbations other therapies which may be used is antibiotics if there is suspicion of atypical pneumonia like azithromycin mucolytics plus minus chest physiotherapy helps when the child is slightly better manual compression is not used anymore bronchoscopy especially when you have secondary mucus plugging and persistent collapse how to prevent exacerbation always all said all asthma done status of you have to prevent that from happening by educating the parents and proper training to the child as well as parent ensuring good compliance of the preventive therapy avoiding the triggers all the triggers told by in the first lecture controlling grd controlling uh, and weight reduction is important in obese nowadays we are seeing a lot of obese children especially after the lockdown and all we have seen all of them gaining weight like 5 to 10 kg in a, in, a, in a year treating vitamin d deficiency is also helpful and monitor them with peak respiratory flows phenos not available at every place uh, again a very good tool to monitor you know inflammation lung function test asthma diary use gina guidelines nowadays they are telling to add formitrol to uh, inhale corticosteroids in children above 5 years that offers a better co uh, control and also they advocate adding montelukast for intermittent symptoms and exercise induced uh, wheez early mdi relievers at home will also help for an acute episode but never ever give only saba like that is a common mistake uh, as practitioners we give only uh, salbutamol to patients that it doesn't work we need to give a control and therapy like inhaled corticosteroids and always take help of the pulmonologist and they will be referring like they'll be doing a better uh, management than us uh, like general pediatricians probably when in in or uh, in severe cases and asthma this has already been covered covid 19 and asthma we uh, just have to know only one thing in well controlled asthma there is no increased risk of severe severe disease in poorly controlled disease and children who have recently taken oral corticosteroids there is a slightly not not children they have just told people who have taken recently oral corticosteroids there is a higher risk of severity uh, because their asthma is poorly controlled but asthma alone doesn't predispose them for a severe disease we need to avoid spirometry in suspects and cases just to prevent spread and vaccines like influenza vaccines can be given with a minimum gap of 2 weeks for uh, a covid vaccine if it, in case it comes for children and always we need to continue the inhaled corticosteroids uh and in case of severe therapy we need to even start oral corticosteroid that may be like that can be used and recently we have we, we are also seeing a lot of children coming with wheez as well as covid 19 positive status so we need to be careful in giving them aerosols like nebulizations and we need to isolate them early and uh, you know try to triage them to prevent further spread and our ic in inhaled corticosteroids protective in covid 19 that is also debatable in adults uh, who have taken inhaled corticosteroids the mortality is slightly uh, reduced that's what is being uh, told in studies and always prevent asthma attacks having a written asthma plan and avoid nebulizers and other aerosol generic procedures as much as possible so coming to the conclusion we need to rule out asthma mimics early early aggressive step wise time sensitive protocol is important uh, to prevent uh, to prevent worsening patient phenotype has to be identified and try and use what works because every patient doesn't respond to all the drugs one patient responds to one better so we need to try and see what works and use them timely respiratory support and break the cycle monitor complications we in early and uh, follow uh, give a discharge plan always remember continuous beta agonist with nebulization with oxygen with uh, early steroids prevent further worsening ipratropium helps uh, provides a lot of help in er setting chest x ray blood gas has no role it only helps in ruling out altern alternate diagnosis catch non responders early and escalate support uh, and avoid invasive ventilation as much as possible early nav has a role thank you thank you for taking more time i think i have taken 10 minutes extra i'd be happy to answer questions if they are ready just... thank you dr uttaya it was an excellent talk on management of acute severe asthma uh, and i think uh, we we don't have much questions uh, in this session uh, what they have asked is when you said continue corticosteroid did you mean the oral or injection anything ma'am actually in a mild to moderate case uh, we can they say say we can oral and iv is the same they they have the same efficacy in a in a acute severe asthma setting yeah. 
but to prevent uh, uh, exacerbation that is different there inhaled is preferred like uh, other ways as a control therapy I'm not sure the about... next question is what the continuous nebulizing with beta 2 agonist what is the risk of hypokalemia what uh, how often do you monitor the child with serum potassium because generally we may yes. not so that's yeah, the, generally ma'am uh, what we have seen is when we exceed q4h like fourth hourly nebulization we at least make sure we do potassium once in a, because many of these children are kept np also they are getting only iv fluids with or without potassium supplementation so many a time when we exceed the this q4h that is when they are requiring uh, hourly or second hourly or even continuous nebula, continuous nebulization we don't give more than 2 hours maybe but when we exceed this more than uh, q4h frequency we uh, end up doing potassium at least once because that uh, also it can contribute to muscle weakness and other problems in an npo child okay uh, dr ashwath has asked in mild and moderate exacerbation we recommend repeated dose of uh, mdi with saba will this not cause hypoxia as per the paradoxical pulmonary vasodilatation theory and that uh, so actually ma'am that is more like that whole that theory is only for severe cases uh, where there is uh, severe like when there is hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and there are more uh, obstructed airways then open airways asthma is a heterogeneous disease some airways are open some are obstructed some are totally blocked but in cases where there is lot of obstructed airway which is supposed to be a severe case then only we see that bq mismatch uh, contributing to hypoxia when we start um, you know uh, only saba only uh, continuous beta beta to beta to agonist but in other cases like mild to moderate we kind of escape even if we nebulize without oxygen because there the risk of bq mismatch is less because the number of obstructed airway is lesser then the open airway okay thank you dr mutia now uh, let's uh, go to the next speaker uh, dr okay. gauri shankar uh, i think uh, everyone knows him well and uh, he was a colleague in ich and i he left the pulmonology when i entered and uh, he's an excellent uh, excellent pediatrician pulmonologist and a bronchoscopist he heads is now the head pediatrics of clinical operation and quality he has got 27 years of uh, experience and his uh, uh, interest is pediatric pulmonology and bronchoscopy asthma and tb he is an editor of ijpp active pediatrician award the one in 2013 he is uh, the author of know your x-rays the ijpp series 2 and he has co-authored the essentials of pediatric pulmonology and he is the associate editor of uh, eight pediatric textbooks and he has contributed to 15 pediatric textbooks he has done a lot of academic work and he has got 18 publications to his credit so over to dr gaugri shankar we are waiting to listen to you am i audible madam uh, audible yeah please proceed yeah okay no i'm i'm sitting between you and your dinner i'll try to finish as quick as possible because when you know foreign body aspiration that means you need to remove it to make the child better that's online uh, uh, like just of what i'm going to talk my humble greetings to all my teachers for helping me to come to this level foreign body aspiration it's a common pediatric respiratory emergency which can be life threatening most of the time history is not forthcoming so you have a wide variation in the presentation the common age group affected is the first 4 years of life between 1 to 3 years is the most common if you miss the diagnosis or if there is a diagnosis of foreign body aspiration it can lead to serious complications if the child presents within 24 hours of foreign body aspiration we term this as an acute foreign body aspiration any presentation beyond 24 hours we term it as a delayed presentation the aspirated foreign bodies can be organic or inorganic why do you need to know about this i'll tell you in a short while organic means nuts seeds bone pieces 
Whereas inorganic means you have beads, coins, pins, small parts of plastic toys, school equipments, including the uh, uh, pen cap, like um, these are all the common inorganic. Organic is the most common and peanuts, you know, is the ubiquitous among the foreign bodies. There is minimal reaction to metallic foreign bodies or plastic foreign bodies, but in organic, you have more issues. That means substances which are lipophilic due to its fatty acid content. There is intense airway inflammation and granuloma tissue formation around the foreign body. Also, the organic foreign body has the ability to absorb water by its inherent nature. So because of this, it can swell and it can modify a partial obstruction to a near total obstruction over a period of time. I told you the common age is between one to three years. Commonly, this is due to lack of molar teeth, decreased ability to masticate, chew the food. Always they have a tendency to put anything and everything into the mouth. Not only that, they are more active. They talk, they run, they chew while chewing and they do all sorts of physical activity. Also, they have a higher respiratory rate. So any object which they keep in the mouth, there is more chance for aspiration. The symptoms, the penetration syndrome, we have a triad. That means a sudden onset of choking, intractable cough and vomiting. This is the penetration syndrome or the triad of symptoms. It can lead to asphyxia very rarely to cardiac but most often it is choking, coughing, sudden onset of acute dyspnea in a well child or sudden onset of wheezing. So these are the common symptoms. Suppose if the foreign body has been missed, it can lead to persistent cough, recurrent fever, pneumonia, hemoptysis, even failure to thrive. Undiagnosed and retained foreign body have more chances for early as well as late complication, including atelectasis as well as bronchiectasis. The final site of the location of foreign body, either in the larynx or tracheobronchial tree, depends on the size of the foreign body and the consistency of the foreign body. Anything which is there in the larynx and trachea is potentially life-threatening because it's going to cause central obstruction. The features of these are, if it is going to be a partial laryngeal obstruction, hoarseness, aphonia, wheezing, and dyspnea. Whereas if it is going to be more distal, that means in the bronchi, there is going to be unilateral wheeze or decreased breath sounds. And I told you retained foreign body, you can have like, cough, recurrent fever, pneumonia, and hemoptysis. Very rarely foreign body aspiration can be asymptomatic, especially when does it happen? Only if the aspirated foreign body has got a lumen in it. Something like a, a ball pen cap. It allows air flow during both phases of respiration. So many a times it may be even asymptomatic except for occasional cough. Clinical exam, most of the time, they will have respiratory distress with or without, with or without tachypnea. It's going to be a central foreign body hypoxemia. And subcutaneous emphysema is very rare. If there is going to be a subglottic foreign body, hoarse voice and strider can be seen. If it is going to be a central foreign body, a biphasic strider or a wheeze will be heard. If the foreign body is localized to one side, it can be localized bees or decreased breath sounds. Complications, we know severe airway obstruction and death in young children because of the small caliber of the airway. This is the life-threatening one. It can even cause death instantly too. But the late complication is bronchiectasis. And if the retained foreign body is an organic, because of its ability to induce extensive local inflammation and form granuloma, it can lead to airway obstruction, add on to the airway obstruction, bronchoscopic identification and removal becomes more difficult. Sometimes they bleed profusely too. Diagnosis often not diagnosed immediately because they don't have specific clinical manifestations, but 
your history, suggestive history of choking. This is the classic clinical presentation with cough, wheeze, and diminished airflow. This indicates most likely this child had had a foreign body aspiration. Differential diagnosis, it can be acute severe asthma. In group, there is strider more than the wheeze. A very dangerous condition by implastic bronchitis. It is diagnosed only after a bronchoscopy. This can mimic a foreign body aspiration. Though vascular trachea, H-type tracheoesophageal fistula, mediastinal tumors, they also present like this, but they are uh, going to have subacute symptoms or slowly progressive symptoms. Whereas your foreign body aspiration, most of the time, dramatic presentation. Investigation, everyone knows that everyone has to have a plain X-ray chest. This is the initial imaging modality. The classical abnormality is going to be a localized hyperinflation. We call it as obstructive emphysema in the affected side. You know, air trapping is there. That means it is going to be one lung is going to be darker. That indicates there is more air trapped in that particular lung but still you'll be able to see the bronchovascular markings. You see it's here, you're able to see the hyperinflation in the left side. Your diaphragm is flattened. You always have to differentiate from a congenital lobar emphysema, always. You need to look for collapse of the underlying or overlying lobes if it is going to be a CLE, because sometimes if we don't look at it in an X-ray lobby, we can get confused. Always look at the X-ray in the X-ray lobby, even if it means that you need to walk 10 steps to go to the X-ray lobby. Other abnormalities. Yes, you can have localized hyperinflation or atelic cases, or sometimes air leak. You are able to see air like under the heart. This is like pneumopericardium here, you are able to see air in the subcutaneous tissue, surgical emphysema. Here you are able to see atelectasis. Rarely you will be able to see an opaque foreign body. Sometimes you will be able to see, see through even in a chest X-ray, you are able to see a small opaque foreign body. Finally, it turned out to be a small teeth which was aspirated and we were able to remove it by rigid bronchoscopy. And many a times a forgotten technique is an inspiration and expiration. Previously forced inspiration and forced expiration, but even with a good inspiration and a good expiration, you'll be able to make out just like in this film. Here we have a doubt whether there is going to be a because it is slightly darker in the right side, but the expiratory film, you see the air trapping in the right side. This is an inspiratory expiratory technique. It is underutilized despite the contributions it can make. X-ray, sometimes there can be difficulty in, in, uh, in the interpretation. Sometimes if it, a patient has got a rotated film, it can cause a unilateral lung hyperlucency. It can mimic an air trapping. How can we overcome? By doing the radio density ratio between the right and the left lung. If it is going to be only due to positional, then your radio density ratio is going to be less than one. If the radio density ratio is going to be more than 1.1, that indicates there is air trapping and you have to proceed with a bronchoscopy. Fluoroscopy previously in uh, early 90s, late 1980s, we used to do fluoroscopy for making a diagnosis of like foreign body before the advent or much wider usage of flexible bronchoscopy. Computed tomography does not localize the foreign body. It reveals only the parenchymal changes due to the effect of the foreign body. Previously, virtual bronchoscopy was being tried in lieu of flexible scopy, but it does not contribute much. Flexible bronchoscopy, this is the investigation of choice for a diagnosis of uh, foreign body aspiration, or even when you are not able to, when, even when there is a possibility of foreign body aspiration, because it reveals the site of foreign body, nature of foreign body, 
presence or absence of the granulation tissue, which will not be revealed by any other investigation. This granulation tissue picking up is going to be very important when the foreign body is going to be removed by the ENT surgeon. If you tell them there is granulation tissue, they'll be very careful while removing. And it also helps the foreign body, once you are able to find out what is the nature of the foreign body, it helps the ENT surgeon beforehand itself to pick up the correct type of the ancillary instrument to remove the foreign body in the first attempt itself. And when you are going to tell the ENT surgeon, yes, this child has got a foreign body in this particular location in the right side of the bronchus, then they are mentally prepared even before they do the procedure. And like uh, uh, the, you can remove flexible uh, foreign body by flexible bronchoscopy, but the small caliber of suction channel, this is one impediment. Number two, prolonged time to grasp the foreign body. And number three, when you're going to try to remove the foreign body with flexible scopy, the tile has to breathe through the space around the scopy and not through the scope as in rigid bronchoscopy. So you can remove a foreign body with the help of flexible bronchoscopy, but at what cost we need to think of? Yes, definitely the child, even though we give oxygen supplementation, that is going to be a risk of hypoxemia. So wherever the chances, wherever you have the facility to have a rigid bronchoscopy, that is the mode of choice for removal of a foreign body in the tracheobronchial tree. Just this is how a foreign body is going to look like when you're going to do a flexible bronchoscopy, a video bronchoscopy. Here, you know, this is deep inside the left main bronchus. You are able to visualize the foreign body. It is a organic, it is a groundnut seed. There is no granulation tissue, no pus outpouring, but there is some inflammation. CT, like many a times when they have a suspicion of foreign body, we have a tendency to even do a CT, but make sure that CT is not the sensitive modality to diagnose a foreign body. Even though you can do tracheobronchial reconstruction, you can try to find out the parenchymal changes. It does not tell what is the nature of the foreign body. It does not tell whether there is granulation tissue or not. Also, the risk of ionizing radiation, everyone has to keep that in mind. See, this is a child who had a sudden onset of respiratory distress with cough he was symptomatically treated with nebulized short-acting beta-2 agonist. The symptoms persisted. So X-ray, antibiotics, antibiotics changed, the but the symptoms persisted. He was referred to a higher center once the child did not improve with antibiotics. But what did the parents do? Many a times this happens. They go to doctor, another doctor. Doctor hopping is one common thing which the parents do. And one more X-ray, it shows definitely there is air trapping in one side. So what happens? They immediately go and do a CT as well as a virtual bronchoscopy. This did not happen now. This happened long time back when I was in my home hospital that was in children's hospital. I was able to see this, get this record. This is a virtual bronchoscopy you are not able to see the details in a virtual bronchoscopy. This is the carina, this is the left main bronchi, this is the right main bronchi. You are not able to see what is there in the right main bronchus, even though you know that there is some obstruction there in the right main bronchus. So finally, what happened? A flexible scopy, we are able to see granulation tissue and a foreign body, a vegetable foreign body, a groundnut, a half piece of groundnut. This was not picked out by any of the investigation, CT, X-ray, or even virtual bronchoscopy. So that is why we always say, whenever you have a suspicion of a, a foreign body aspiration, kindly do a flexible bronchoscopy so that you'll be able to make a diagnosis. This is the same child after removal of the foreign body. 
notorious for causing a granulation tissue are these two betel nuts and tamarind seed even a single day with betel nut inside the airway you can see extensive granulation tissue so management removal is the treatment in foreign body aspiration it all depends on the site of impaction of the foreign body when do you do an emergency rigid bronchoscopy especially if it is going to be in the larynx subglottis or trachea when it is going to cause a central obstruction if it is going to be in one of the main bronchus then you can do it comparatively less airway problem so you can do it electively too like rigid bronchoscopy is not available in all medical centers and not all ent surgeons are good in doing a rigid scopy in small children especially in less than 12 months it needs a good skill otherwise you can have bronchospasm also technical difficulties to remove to catch the foreign body and remove it also if you are not good in your technique if the rigid scope or the forceps touches the bronchial wall or if you take a longer time to remove it it can all lead to bronchospasm very rarely you can have complications one is failure to extract remove the foreign body second you can injure the trachea you can cause pneumothorax pneumomediastinum sometimes injury even to the occlusal cords after the procedure what complication can set in you can have occlusal cord edema when it happens how do you treat we treat with steroids dexamethasone it reduces the glottic edema in 2 days like you give it for 2 days if we have granulation tissue even though none of the textbooks tells like to give steroids this is what has been followed in ich for a long period of time when we see granulation tissue we give steroids for 5 to 7 days and taper and stop and you have many algorithms when you have a suspected foreign body as if you have a foreign body uh, if you have a witness choking it is one noisy breathing is one unilateral reduced uh, air entry is one new onset recurrent or persistent wheeze is 2 abnormal x ray is 2 if the score is less than 1 follow up score is 2 to 3 then do a flexible scopy if the score is 4 to 5 a rigid scopy a score is 5 means urgent rigid scopy otherwise i will end up with rigid bronchoscopy if any one of the following asphyxia radio opaque foreign body unilaterally decreased breath sounds and obstructive emphysema flexible bronchoscopy in all other cases if flexible bronchoscopy identifies foreign body rigid scopic removal is the ideal one yes that is the end of my lecture madam thank you for the opportunity thank you dr gauri shankar Who else? But those who worked in ICH, I think you would have seen any number of foreign bodies, any presentation, central trachea. So many, even in this short, uh, my of my uh, staying in pulmonology, I've seen so many different types of foreign bodies in different places: mobile, migratory, stuck, vegetable, one-year-old, three-year-old foreign bodies, and all that. So the, uh, thank you, Gauri Shankar, especially the scoring that you gave last. That was really good. When and. any time you may suspect a foreign body definitely a scope i think there is no second thoughts about it anyone else there are no questions here i think you've been very clear everybody is hungry yeah uh, thank you madam on uh, behalf of iap tnc i thank uh, uh, dr gauri shankar and uh, as a convener he has organized a wonderful uh, uh, respiratory uh, uh, cme uh, thank you uh, really thankful to dr gauri shankar sir thank you dr gauri and i thank uh, dr elidarsi madam and uh, vijay sagaran sir as a chair person for this uh, meeting and i thank all the uh, speakers dr somu sobalan dr sarat balaji and uh, dr sneha varki dr victor dr kalpana and dr antony and as well as dr mithya priya uh, karpan 
and i thank our uh, beloved uh, uh, president dr ismail sir who has uh, given this opportunity for organizing this uh, event and uh, dr ismail uh, present is there yeah a few words uh, thank you rajendra i think it was a wonderful feast give the, the platter was so good i don't know which dish is uh, better much which is dish is tastier i don't know to say that uh, especially victor spoke in a very beautiful way and my friend gauri shankar and uh, anthony they were besmarizing today especially sharad bala ji all have done their justice to the topics and really though it is getting late i think the crowd it was really close to 250 odd people and i think uh, it is a wonderful feast given by the palmology thanks gauri shankar for organizing yes. and thank you for all the uh, speakers Uh, IAP, uh, profoundly thank you for everything, and I suppose thank Rajendra for also coordinating this uh, big event. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What of thanks, Dr. Thirumurugan? Yeah. Dr. Thirumurugan. Dr. Thiru. Yeah. Ah, uh, Cholong sir. Hello sir. Yeah. What of thanks, Cholong sir? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. <clears throat> I think. Um, uh, pretty long cme with five hours and still more than 100 people 100 uh, people still listening to it let me start with, uh, uh, with with offering my thanks to dr gauri shankar who has been very patient in organizing a galaxy of uh, for true pulmonologists and intensive care specialists for this program i mean it's very rare to find such good set of uh, people and they are offering some excellent uh, speaker uh, talks and uh, so thank you sir i thank both the chair persons professor vijay sekran and professor uh, elilarsi madam for uh, staying throughout the program and uh, uh, organizing the i mean uh, conducting the topics very well thank you both of them uh, i thank all the speakers uh, i think uh, this is one of the very clear and uh, simple yet uh, complex though the comp comp sorry the topics were complex they were well simplified so thanks to all the speakers i should thank our president and secretary uh, for organizing this cme actually dr rajendran takes a huge of, uh, effort in trying to organize so i i especially thank him i thank all the delegates who who uh, who stayed sat back till the end to listen to the uh, talks and also to give